is Jacqueline Zanona. I am from National City, California, and I'm joined today by my mother and my tia, Michelle. So um, today we're going to be having a conversation centered around equity in the climate justice movement. Um, I'm sitting down with probably the most influential people in my life, um, my mother, a parent, and then my tia, who has um, always had that perspective of being a steward, whether it's for our family or for the land of our, of our culture. And so I thought that we could have a lot of great discussions today and cultivate some knowledge to share. Thank you. I'm Michelle Luna Reynoso. I'm from National City, uh, born and raised. Jacqueline is my niece and Janice is my sister and they're my best friends. Buenos dias, buenas tardes, depending on what time you're listening to this. My name is Janice Luna Reynoso. I was born and raised here on Kumeyaay land in San Diego, National City, um, and really glad to be here with my daughter, Jacqueline Zenona Reynoso Marquez. I'm really proud of her and um, also sitting next to one of my role models, even though she's younger than me, um, my sister, Michelle. Thank you for this opportunity. So I wanted to open up our conversation today talking about how you have viewed the climate change or the climate justice movement thus far. Um, who have you seen leading it? What influences? What solutions have been offered? And then after that, if you can explain how you can see flaws in it, how it's not necessarily considered like equitable to all peoples and so forth. Um. I guess I, I seen a huge shift from when I was younger to now that I'm an adult and we have things like the internet and social media um, to spread information. Initially, to, to me, climate justice was recycling. And I got that from Janice, um, the importance to recycle. And even then, back then, mm -hmm. like nobody really got it. Your Nana, my mom didn't really understand the importance of it. We just knew that it was a thing. Right. But like, there's not like that deep understanding or the larger picture of, of why you're really doing it. And then as I got older, uh, I went away to college. And then I learned about things like environmental racism. Mm -hmm. And then things start making a little bit more sense. I understood why it was that we were able to afford a house next to a freeway. Mm -hmm. I understood why it was um, that I would get sick so often when I was younger and why antibiotics wouldn't work because the freeway was in our backyard. And then even something like your doctor not understanding where mm -hmm. you grow up. So the doctors thought I wasn't taking my medicine. Um, and same thing with I mean, your Theo Michael, my brother, um, had chronic bronchitis, got asthma, and I mean, it even plays into your day-to-day -day life, but mm -hmm. also your diagnosis. And if your doctor doesn't understand the environment that you live in, how do you properly diagnose? Mm -hmm. Or you assume that we're not following your orders, but you don't understand that medicine is not going to respond to us the same way if we have constant toxins in our life. And so mm -hmm. it was, you know, Growing up, you don't understand that, but once I got, went to college, I had all these flashbacks sitting in lecture rooms like, oh my God, that's why the, you know, the antibiotics didn't work. And you know, not, not being able to understand it in the moment. And um, it, it was like a huge enlightenment when you're able to like leave home and reach higher education. But had I not had that experience, it would just be like, you walk through your life experiencing all of these things. Um, and then now as an adult, we have social media, the spread of knowledge, and so now it's accessible to day-to-day -day people, right? So that knowledge that I had to get in a, a lecture room and pay a lot of money for, now people, if you make a video and you spread it online, then they're, now they're able to get that education. I think that's super cool. That's so cool. Yeah, but I still think it's harder to reach out to the older generations mm -hmm. and um, and I talk to you about this a lot, that struggle that I have with people in my Danza Azteca group. So it's more of a traditional, uh, a lot of older people that participate in preserving the knowledge of our indigenous people from Mexico. 
but a lot of our practices don't reflect that. And it's like having to teach them like, okay, we're going to have an event, like let's not do styrofoam, yeah. <laughs> you know, or let, we're having an event, let's not buy Coke yeah. um, that contaminates the water and, and takes over your water rights. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a constant struggle, but you do see like the distinction of that spread of knowledge between generations, between um, people that have access to higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting as like a person traveling through those worlds to observe that. But not just only observe it, like you, we're very hands-on, we try to educate people mm -hmm. from a place of love. And from a place, it's different when you educate somebody when you're from the places that they're from. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Education definitely played a big role in my development and understanding the environment. I mean, I can think back to being in elementary school and learning about recycling and the environment. And that's when I started to do that, setting up recycling bins in our kitchen. And, and then it would get thrown in the trash. And it was just like this constant struggle, even within our own communities, with the most caring people, with the most loving people, with our people. Um, so there's, you know, even speaking to the, to the duality and the challenges that we've had, um, and then learning about organizations back then, it was like Greenpeace and the Sierra, Sierra Club, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that was all that I heard of in, in these issues that are impacting the world, but more so understanding environmental racism and seeing that we're frontline communities that are impacted first and foremost by these issues that are discriminated against, that our lives aren't valued. The water we drink is less valuable unless there's a monetary profit. And so I was able to receive this information, not by having traditional higher education, like going off to college, but I was fortunate enough to practice and receive training through a resident leadership academy that taught us systems leadership and training and how we can create these projects to create impact in our community and understanding how a system does what it's designed to do. And so then what? You have the data, you have the information, your community was designed. Um, with the foundation of environmental racism and profit for others that are benefiting from that. And, and so now what, right? Instead of just having that information and being angry, and as we rightfully should be, we can then take those tools to create change, to create projects, to speak the language maybe that might be more understandable to the powers that be because we can point to a PowerPoint and use um, more sophisticated language, so to speak. And so that has been, uh, a great tool for me and for my daughters and some work that we've done in the community. I'm really thankful for that opportunity. And then even on a higher level, I wanna say, um, not just globally and regionally, but also connecting back spiritually and our natural connection as um, indigenous people or having ancestors that are indigenous um, and really understanding that they had it right we had it right from the beginning, and um, another organization, Centro Cultural de la Raza, has really done great work in expanding the voice of frontline communities, not just what we think of here in the U.S. or in the barrios or in the hoods. It's also understanding that this has been taking place through colonization in Mexico. We have the movements in Chiapas by the Zapatistas that have been speaking this language, and just now, you know, a lot of people, a lot more people, including myself, have been able to connect and been able to translate it in a sense to say what has impacted those communities, it will impact us and will now impact not just frontline communities, but affluent white communities as well. And so I'm thankful for this bridging of mothers out front to be able to connect those dots and to give us opportunity as women of color, as leaders of color, where traditionally you see we don't, we're not in those positions to have the voice, to have the stature, to have even the education sometimes to really voice that we are the experts on things that affect us the most. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, a few years ago I received a training uh, of equity and inclusion in environment and just stating the facts that most people in leadership are not um, people of color when in fact the service that are being provided or the help as we say, is being given to these communities of color and we need to see more leadership that reflects that. Um, so if you really want to make that impact and spread you know, the causes, empower the people that are impacted the most so that they're the leaders um, and that's something that you know, I encourage everyone listening to do.
<clears throat> so something that I would really like to center my advocacy around is the fact that our story or my story isn't unique and it's not special and it's not um, something that's like a rarity for a brown family to grow up by the freeway and have to go through all of these hurdles and all of this adversity to get where we are today because when you talk about recycling and our family not necessarily prioritizing that and then you look back historically what um, many communities of concern were going through in the 90s which is like the crack epidemic drug use abusive relationships things that were really hitting our communities hard um, had those resources for healing and mending and remediation been available to families like ours and many others maybe perhaps we could have gotten the recycling thing down or maybe perhaps we could have gotten the reduced reusing down and and so forth so it's like now that we can see with clarity now that that may perhaps have been a large block to our families getting into this environmental justice movement how are we able to make that relationship clearer to the world and to organizations like Mothers Out Front, like the Sierra Club, like Greenpeace, that there needs to be an intersectionality, that we need to have communications with volunteers about what else are they going through in their life that is preventing them from being a climate activist. Yeah, and that's something that I, I really try to ri remind a lot of spaces that I'm in about mm -hmm. um and you can you can get academic about it and talk about maslow's hierarchy of needs which is like you can't expect a child to sit in a classroom and pay attention if they don't have adequate housing and food at home mm -hmm. right because they have to take care of their basic needs first in order to be able to focus and then you can get more revolutionary about it and really look at models like what the Black Panthers did with their breakfast program. They understood that people couldn't get involved in a revolutionary movement. They couldn't get involved in changing their communities and taking care of their communities if they didn't have food, mm -hmm. if they didn't have shelter or the clinics that they did. I mean, they really had that concept down. And why did they have that concept down? Because they were from those communities. So it changes when you have leadership that really understands things. And when I was um, able to study in Mexico City even, so you think this is like maybe uh, an American issue or like a, a WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant issue that we have in the United States, but it's not. I think it, it's, it is a hierarchy issue and um, it is like an institutional issue, which is white, even in Mexico. So when I was in Mexico City, I, I attended uh, a conference and they were talking about how they went into these indigenous communities and it was a specific indigenous community in the interior of Mexico. They built them this amazing fish tank system so that they could feed themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, these people had never eaten fish right. and like nobody bothered to ask them that. Right. So now these fish tanks went to waste all of this money that they generated from this program because like, and now they're using them for like something else and it was totally useless. Because nobody bought, and it was, right. it blew my mind and I'm sitting there and I'm like asking like, you never bothered to ask these people what it was that they ate in order to make a sustainable program to allow them to nourish themselves. So having somebody from the community at the table, giving you and not understanding to check yourself and check your privilege and knowing that just because you have a degree or you've been involved in an organization, you don't know everything about everything. And it's so important if you're going to come into a community to hire somebody or bring somebody to the table that knows the resources, the people, the environment of what you're trying to fix. And I think that makes the world of difference and that's what makes any program sustainable. Yeah, I think we're, we're trying to get far from from the notion of the white, the white savior, excuse me. Um, and I'm really thankful to have this opportunity to speak to a diverse um, audience and be a part of an organization that wants to listen, that is asking us what we need. And again, I ask for those tools and those um, 
the resources for us to continue to do this work. Um, doing this work on a voluntary basis, I mean, we do it, we breathe it, we live it, we, you know, we eat this, um, but also creating those positions for those that have uh, the financial means and the resources. Um, no one, we understand no one's gonna get rich off of this, but it's really giving us the tools so that we can feed our families and continue to do this work that we would do anyway. And so a lot of times it's taken for granted that because we're there, because honestly we feel we don't have a choice where we're, it's, it's you know ride or die, life or death, to be able to do this um, so that our future generations, and not just our future generations, but our living children, people that are alive, our grandparents can continue to sustain or live or just get by another day. Um, you know, we ask that, that that's not taken for granted, that that's not taken lightly, that we also need to be able to provide for our families. Um, and so those that are listening and th when the opportunities arise, you know, have our back too, because we've had your back since day one. We've, this country, um, and other countries have been built on the work, the labor, the sweat and tears of, you know, communities of concern or indigenous communities. And again, bringing back that voice of, okay, we're here, we're going to make this work, but really do you see us? Um, and, you know, speak our language, not just, you know, technically, but really coming in and asking what it is that we can that we can help each other with and what it is that we need. Uh, along those lines, being a leader from the community, we also um, need to be mindful whether uh, we are very well versed in, in environmental justice issues or equity issues is to not become that toxic leader. So we also need to hold ourselves accountable. Um, there is even colorism in our communities. We see it in Mexico all the time, different, you know, lighter shade um, Mexican woman versus a black Mexican woman um, and how we're seen and heard. And then also our levels of education or even with that aside is how do we treat our community by assuming that we heard them out last year and we know what they want needs change you know and there's culture shifts and different urgencies that arise and so we also um, as people of color um, or visitors coming in to help need to continue to ask these questions and check in and ask to be held accountable on this work that we're doing I think it's wonderful the insight that you offered and it really helps create a sustainable relationship with the climate justice movement because there is this very big issue of folks burning out and kind of burning the candle at both ends by being like an advocate and then also being a regular day-to-day -day person, whether you're a mother, whether you're a caretaker, whether you're taking care of your parents, the elderly, those are things that are also coinciding with this climate justice movement. And speaking to privilege, and to colorism as well, we have to kind of deconstruct all of those notions first within ourselves and then our communities. And it's very important that we have a climate justice movement that is rooted and has that foundation of addressing those issues and also um, hopefully one day obliterating them completely because you can have climate justice, but you can have climate justice that is racist. Mm -hmm. You can have climate justice that is telling brown poor people to no longer have children anymore, which is an act of genocide. So it's very important that we address this and that it's all tied in and that there is intersectionality within our climate justice movement. Because if your climate justice movement isn't intersectional, then it's not climate justice by definition. So it, it is awesome that we are able to speak to it and that we're able to radicalize this movement because it needs to be radical. It needs to be what it is and this what we have the reality that we have is an act of violence towards poor people and so not necessarily that the movement needs to be violent but it definitely does need to be radical in the sense whether it's radical healing radical remediation radical love um, I think it, it needs to be radicalized and I'm really glad that you brought up the colorism because I'm very aware of it and I've spent a large part of my life navigating through this world being aware of my white privilege and what I'm going to use it for what am I going to do with it because 
if I'm going to be completely honest, I'm sure there was years and moments of just having like a pity party for myself that people aren't going to like me. Girls are going to bully me because I'm fair skinned because I'm light skinned. But you need to get over that really quick. Like it's just a little boohoo moment. You feel excluded. It's nothing compared to the institutionalized hate towards brown people and people of color. And so I'm so grateful and and I almost feel even more privileged because I had a family who constantly broke it down to me. Even the car footage, which was the first event that I spoke at with Mothers Out Front and when I recited the freeway poem, standing ovation, the the board spoke to me directly and I'm showing it to my Nana like, Nana, look, look what happened. And like the first words out of her mouth are, it's because you're white. (laughs) <laughs> and it was like, yes, like there, there is the humbling that I need, you know, because it is so true. There have been people of color, activists of color, indigenous folks who have been saying what I'm saying for generations, for <laughs> centuries. And here comes this little white girl with curly hair and a cute button nose and, and says it. And people are willing to listen because I don't have a look that is perceived, perceived as like volatile or violent because of that privilege that I have so get to know your privilege sit with your privilege don't try to to brush it away and say oh no I'm not privileged because we all have privileges and if to not use them to help our communities is like such honestly a waste um and I think it's important that we all acknowledge how we're going to use our privilege even you being able to attend college, you know, you being able to go to that RLA program, you having the support of a family to perhaps be caretakers of your children so you could go to work. These are all, unfortunately, should not be viewed as privileges, but in a post-colonial world, it is a privilege. So bringing that back to this conversation and, yeah. I don't, I don't know if, ooh. Um, I don't know. I don't want to. In- yeah. So keep your no. thought. But um, I want to ask both of you all mm-hmm. to make it a positive conversation. Mm-hmm. So we talked about the inequities as far mm-hmm. as like mm-hmm. not being inclusive or why it is that people of color can't be involved mm-hmm. in uh, climate justice. So what are some things that organizations or people mm-hmm. or we personally can do in order to open up those spaces or to be more inclusive? Mm-hmm. What are your ideas on, on that? I have my own ideas, but I want to hear your ideas. So I think language is like a really wonderful thing. It has the power and the tools to bring people together, but it also separates us greatly from our communities. And I think something really wonderful that I've learned actually from my mom is that to have things written in like a third grade reading level or in something, because we also don't want to exclude children or elders from this from this whole entire movement. And so when something is written in in a way that a small child could understand or someone who is not necessarily at a high reading level, you are inviting so many others to the movement. We often think we need to use like these big fancy academic language in order to appeal a higher cast of systems so that way we may appear valid and our movement may appear valid to them. But that's like looking at the wrong side. We need to feel validated by our community in the sense that they feel like they belong because they do belong and so having whether it's flyers that you're distributing um literature informational packets it needs to be written at in a language in which everyone can understand and imagery is really important with that art is really important art has a capability to bring folks together and to understand something um and sometimes we don't even necessarily need spoken word to get a message across there's wonderful storytelling that is done and I think that's also something that I feel has been very healing in this movement is the power of storytelling and hearing my nana tell me stories and my mom tell me stories and you tell me stories of ways in which they have felt healed by this planet or have done the healing to this planet 
So I think to look at the positives in that and how we have used communication to bring our communities close and how we have that insight with one another. Different learning languages and really not just praising, but honoring the different styles of work ethic, um, creative, you know, creative culture. Uh, some of your employees or volunteers might be very talented and they don't necessarily always get a, a chance to shine mm -hmm. if it's not in a, I want to say, cubicle setting or in a traditional setting. So the artists, the musicians, the singers, the poets, mm -hmm. if that's what they're bringing to the table, you know, not just utilize, but honor that because it can bring so much um, passion to your work. It can bring so much more um, impact to your message you know look for those people there i'm pretty sure they're in all the groups out there especially we're, when we're talking about equity work and just really lift that up um, and learn from them and there's an opportunity always you know for them to uh, so to speak fall in line with the mission but i believe that the creative people the creative learner the creative teacher advocate the artist as we like to say um, is really going to be at the forefront. You know, I heard a, a phrase or a comment about the artist in society has always been the person that challenges reality and what is to be. And so I really, um, I really want to praise that for the organizations, for the people that are working with creative individuals, artists um, that really help them in their trajectory. And really, they have all the potential to be leaders. They definitely have the platform to do that once once that stage or that door is open for them. Another thing that organizations, companies, that everybody can do, and when I see it, it just fills my heart, is to claim honor and give respect to the native land that you're on, the indigenous land and the peoples. Mm -hmm. You know, we're very fortunate here in San Diego to still have uh, Kumeyaay community present and active, and it's you know, the organizations that are naming that, the people that are naming that, the businesses, you know, that's, that's the least that we can do from all the, that we privilege, um, that we're privileged to be here. Um, and especially if you're making a profit or you're, um, you have the plight of, you know, environmental justice and equity, if we're not naming that, you know, there's, there's something wrong. We're not really understanding the foundation and then the future trauma that's been based on the inequities. Um, but to put a positive tone on it, those that are doing that, um, I, I really, not, not applaud you because it's what we're supposed to be doing, but keep doing that and maybe, you know, it catches on to others. Yeah, it catches on to government and other municipalities where they, where they understand where they're at. They need to recognize. <laughs> I think um, understanding a community's needs. When you're working with people in your organization that don't have as much of a disposable income as you, I think as an organizational leader, that's super important to recognize. If you want somebody to come to your meeting, ask them if they need childcare. Make it, you know, have somebody available to take care of their children or invite them to bring their children, have a table with crayons set up or something, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's huge. Um, acknowledging that they may have longer working hours than you. Have mm -hmm. food at your event. Mm -hmm. If people, if you want people to come, I mean, yeah. you have to be cognizant of where they're coming from. Do they have children to feed at home? Um, you know. I think that's huge, and I really appreciate that you always do that. When you invite people to come support your initiatives at city council, those meetings go from like, what, 6 p.m. to like midnight sometimes. You have coffee, you have food, you have dessert. And you know what I mean? And, and, and we're prepared for that. And sometimes I think we even have stuff for the kids to do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's super inclusive to be able to do that and acknowledge that working people, people of color, um, don't have the ability to come if like there's no food. It, it is, it's very taxing. And as far as inviting them to participate, you, you can't ask them to support something, your initiative, if that initiative doesn't reflect what they actually need. In order for it to be sustainable, you need to have their feedback, like 100%. And 
just, you know, making meetings so that you check in with them. What is their mental health like at the moment? What stresses mm -hmm. are they going through? Do you have resources for them to tap into? And acknowledging, like, again, their disposable income. You shared an incident, you know, you attended a meeting and they were like, okay, great, can you make the copies and pass it out? Mm -hmm. It's like, I can't afford to send a mailer out. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to understand what people can and cannot do. And I know with you, like with me, my time is very limited. So when you say, hey, I need your help, I'm like, that's too broad. Give me a, an assignment. Mm -hmm. I'm that type of person. So like you said, recognizing people's leadership styles. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to just be there kind of on call. But if you tell me I need you to do X, Y, and Z by this date, I got you. Mm -hmm. So I think... You know, being really in touch with people and understanding what they're capable of doing economically. Mm -hmm. I brought up the example, you know, before working um, with, with Lanza Azteca, if we had an event, I said, you know, please, whoever, you know, we all have like a, a sign up mm -hmm. list. Somebody volunteered to purchase the plates. I said, please don't purchase styrofoam plates. Me understanding that I probably have more income than that person, I offered to purchase it mm -hmm. because I would rather spend a little bit extra in purchasing paper plates mm -hmm. than for that person. And, you know, they were doing it out of the kindness of their heart, but I was also being respectful of them and not expecting them to be able to afford the more expensive plates. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think being able to offer yourself and be everything should be on a sliding scale. Absolutely. People's income, um, people's time. So you have to be super aware of that. And I feel like a lot of the traditional institutions and organizations are not mm -hmm. aware of that. Yeah, speaking of which, being sensitive to socioeconomic status or current status, because it might fluctuate. You know? yeah. One day I'm like a baller, and the next day I'm like, I couldn't make it to meetings. I can name like 10 times in the last year where I couldn't go to a meeting because my car broke down last minute and I didn't have time to make arrangements. Obviously, our you know transit mm -hmm. system isn't as efficient as we would like it to be. Um, I didn't have gas money, you know, when I was waiting on it to come in. So it's like, mm -hmm. if I'm experiencing that and ha having some privilege, um, just really asking our constituents and other people, like, are you able to make it? Do you need a ride? And even if you can't help, even if you yourself don't have gas money that day and you know, you're going through your thing, at least you ask and then you can start that conversation and maybe plan for next time. So that's super important. Another thing too, you know, again, speaking from my own traumas and experiences, I've you know, advocated in front of city council numerous times and I spoke to the fact that we were displaced, me and my children, and I'm we're living below the poverty level, financially speaking. Otherwise, we're really rich. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a woman said she's she said that I was lying because I had a laptop and because I was dressed well and I was eloquent. Wow. I could probably speak really good English, too, you know, if she wanted to throw that in, in there. And so it's like, wow, you know, to assume that because we're educated or clean. eloquent or clean or have a laptop or our kids, you know, look good and their hair's done, that we're not suffering financially or emotionally or going through our own trauma or abuse you know so just being sensitive to that and um even if you don't have that conversation just to even think or to speak of it and you know you might be limited in your capacity in your organization to help but just starting that conversation to name what's happening in our communities again um understanding that it's not we don't choose this um this has been years of trauma um, and, and that it has impacted our communities by the way of design, by white supremacy and other issues that continue to impact us. And so now what, right? Again, I want to try to turn the conversation into, into more positive, you know, action-based things that we can talk about, things that we're doing. Um, we have the data, we have the, the personal experience, the shared experience, the education in our own ways. You know, what is it that we're doing? Um, not just with Mothers Out Front, I feel like Mothers Out Front, you know, brings attention and gives us a platform to speak, but we have been active in our own projects, you know, some of us for over a decade. Um, and so I would like to speak to some of the positive things that we're taking on in our communities, whether it be local, regionally, you know, statewide, nationally or globally. 
I think it's very important for us to establish that our climate justice movement is not going to be rooted in white supremacy. It's not going to be rooted in capitalism because we can have a solution to this climate destruction that is happening. But if it's rooted in capitalism and instill an extractive economy, it'll ultimately not be sustainable. And we might end up back where we started or far worse. And so that's kind of brings me into my next phase of this conversation is how are we going to shift our values and the values of people on our level for example i'm not going to tell a single mom with four kids to stop using disposable cutlery because if she's working multiple jobs i'm i'm not going to dictate what a person is going to do but i can speak to folks on my level and on my privilege single kids in their 20s who may have a more of a disposable income and have conversations about how are we going to understand that yes it sucks after a party to have to do all those dishes at the end of the night and we know this we've given up disposable cutlery in our family for a while now and at the end of every party the kitchen is a mess and we have to put in like two three hours to clean it all up and wash all the cups and wash all the forks and wash all the spoons but we've shifted our values to understand that that is more sustainable and producing less waste for our environment than if we had even bought in the the paper plates instead of the styrofoam plates. So it's like we have to talk to people who are on the same level of privilege as us and have to shift those values. And I just want to know, like, what conversations have you had with those close to you? What decisions have you had to cut in your life? What conversations have you had to have with yourself, like the plastic toothbrush and maybe using reusable menstrual products and so forth and such how are we going to have conversations within our community about that First answer my question. oh what was your question <laughs> what was that my question was what are you doing oh. or what have you been active in um as far as environmental well, justice kind of, yeah i guess together. that, that yeah. goes too i think they go together i think personally like the conversations i've had to have with myself one of them being textile pollution. I have always been, for lack of a better word, it's like a fashionista, you know? <laughs> like, I love cute clothes. I love pretty things. I love the color pink. I love having multiple outfits. I used to be that girl who would buy a new dress for every single dance and every single family party because that was my personality type. And so growing up, and becoming more aware of these worldly problems that we're having, having to have a conversation with myself and say, you don't need a new dress every single event that you go to. That's not sustainable for the planet or for myself economically. So having to cut back on that, and then that has kind of pushed me. You all have seen my movement to like rely on community and having like clothing drives to have shared closets I mean our family's really good about that we don't necessarily go out and buy a pair of red shoes if I know my mom has a pair of red shoes that I can borrow maybe she won't get them back but <laughs> you know and that's just an example and even the reusable menstrual products it's like I've had to have conversations with myself about that as well too because it's those are things that I can shift my value and yes maybe it's more laboring to have to wash cloth pads but it is more sustainable for myself and for the planet. And so those are things that I can do as a singular individual without having to convince anyone, but also by doing that as an individual, I may be inspiring others to do so. For example, like sharing that I'm using reusable menstrual products on my Instagram, people have questions. That's not even something folks are taught anymore in this day and age, which is like really unfortunate because we know that lack of menstrual products is a serious need in communities of concern um so I'm like where do I start I'll start with, with what I do personally so growing up in a Mexican household a lower income Mexican household we grew up we, we, not, we may not have recycled in a traditional mm -hmm. sense about putting things in a bin but we were very much recycle um, a recycle family as far as reusing containers mm -hmm. and reusing products and saving plastic bags. So I've carried that over into my adult life and um, sharing that with my husband's family and 
he hates on me but it does become useful but like saving all the jars i love jars washing them reusing those and so now my mother-in-law's kitchen is like filled with like uh very pretty reused jars from mm -hmm. pasta sauces or whatever it is that that we may have so i think i've influenced them in, in that sense um I've influenced them as far as like cleaning products go, you know, using vinegar and water-based solutions because it's better for us and we have dogs and they really care about the dogs. And so, you know, telling them that we can clean with that so that's not harmful to, to our pets and whatever's not harmful to our pets is obviously not mm -hmm. harmful to us or to the environment. Mm -hmm. So I think the family being the nucleus of those changes, it makes a huge impact because then they share those with mm -hmm. their friends, mm -hmm. right? Um, hearing my, my mother-in-law share, you know, with, with her employees that also have pets like, oh, you, you know, you should clean with this because it's better for your, for your pets mm -hmm. and it's better for you. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's huge mm -hmm. because it, it does become, especially at least speaking from like a Mexican background, that word of mouth is huge. Mm -hmm. Being able to share that information is huge. Um, so I think that that is a, a, a big part of it. And mm -hmm. same thing, you know, as a woman, um, reusable menstrual items um, that's a huge that was a huge thing for me being low income um, in law school being super broke knowing to make the investment to have reusable items as opposed to buying and being heavily taxed uh, every month was just like a smart decision for me and sharing that with like friends was also interesting to them. We you know they, they, it's maybe a little bit scary for them to understand like to use a menstrual cup and and um, having to really be like super uh, embodied. It, yeah, <laughs> getting to know your body and like all aspects of it. It's it's scary to yeah. people, but it's like that's that's sad that that was taken away from you. Mm -hmm. But it's also a smart choice. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're able to connect that with people, like yeah, it's an investment. You buy something where it's reusable. It's like cheaper in the long run. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's a huge step, right? Yeah. And um, as far as like the personal struggles that we have, my, my husband, husband is a business owner and there's one thing that like we've been constantly going back and forth about is, is the use of styrofoam products in mm -hmm. their restaurant. And it's tied to you know, their sustainability and being a small business and now the, the mm -hmm. minimum wage going up is really going to affect him. So he's trying to make the decision now is, do I get rid of an employee that's the dishwasher because minimum wage is going up and it could break our business? Or do we move to disposable plates and, and uh, mm -hmm. utensils? Mm -hmm. And I am super against it, but then I'm like, okay, now, like, what, do, what does that mean? Do I have to help him now in cleaning it or finding somebody? Or That's a huge decision. And I think people at the top don't really realize how hard those decisions are. And he's a very smart person, so he understands the impact to, right. to the environment, which is why I'm sure he mentioned it to me because he doesn't want me to walk in and be like, what's this? <laughs> what are we doing? Uh, but those decisions are really hard to make. Mm -hmm. um, but making small changes in your day-to-day -day life definitely influence people because people ask. Like, oh, like, you reuse that jar or, like, you do yeah. that. Like, you know? Mm -hmm. It, so that'd be cute if they had like a special like if you brought in your own like to go container or something i brought that up but it's a little it's still a little yeah. bit more work because you have to have somebody designated for that and there's like a whole process with the county and mm -hmm. like food it's hard it's hard to make those decisions mm -hmm. and then as far as like the organizations that we're all a part of um I, I am a board member for Mundo Gardens, which is your organization. And my job is, as an attorney is to help with the legal aspect of things and checking things and uh, helping you frame policy language and giving my feedback on that or public speaking, you know, giving you my tips. And just be over, overall general support for, for Mundo Gardens. Uh, but with Mothers Out Front, you know, it's really important to be connected that way. And I really like the way that People's Legal Services, another nonprofit that I'm a part of, has, they understand that. They understand the sisterhood of organizations mm -hmm. and the need to support each other. So when Mundo Gardens has something, People's Legal Services shares it right away. Mm -hmm. And when you have something with Mothers Out Front, Mundo Gardens shares it right away. Mm -hmm. So having that partnership is super important, understanding to be supportive and 
And I, I haven't gotten the sense with the organizations that we're a part of that we're in competition. Mm -hmm. It's the understanding of like, we are a network. Right. And that's huge because it really, whatever you share, it's still promotion for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a great thing that we're able to do. And um, with the help of Mothers Out Front, I really hope that we get support to move forward with the community gardens that you've been working on and really understanding the struggles with that. Uh, people of color in communities like National City, which have you know more limited green space, that have pollution surrounding us, either whether it's the freeways running through all of National City, uh, the car uh, shops that you know the mechanic shops, or like the bay that has been taken up in the South Bay with polluters like like NASCO. So having organizations like Mundo, Mundo Gardens and Mothers Out Front to promote green spaces to promote free um, healthy food is huge and it's sad to see people constantly mm -hmm. battling us on on those issues like why are you fighting us when we're trying and, and a lot of we our supporters understand that though they don't understand why the uh, institution has been tra challenging us on those things mm -hmm. Thank you. It brings me back to a term I just recently learned. Um, we generally refer to National City as a food desert or a food swamp because there's food, but it's a lot of it or most of it is unhealthy. Mm -hmm. A lot of fast food restaurants, limited grocery stores, especially depending on where you live in National City, like on the west side. So, yes, we were founders of the first and only community garden in National City. That was a big accomplishment for Mundo Gardens and the community that helped us get started, the family, our family from Southeast San Diego, from Shelltown, National City community, Victory Gardens helped us out. Um, so many people came to support us. And so that was, you know, the foundation that we started our work in. Not really. The foundation is family and our roots. And my mother was a campesina. My grandparents worked out in the field. So having all of that inspire us um, really laid the, the path for what we're doing now. Um, and then the continued support. Yeah, those partnerships have been crucial. Um, we're, you know, hoping to have another community garden out on the Paradise Creek on the west side, thanks to Olivewood Gardens, Paradise Creek Educational Park, Inc. What's up? Shout out to you um, for all the work you've done, Environmental Health Coalition, Mothers Out Front, all of the support for ongoing work. Um, you know, it takes investment. It's building those relationships, you know, where I might need more support on the administrative end. I'd rather be out with the kids, you know, out of El Tayon at the school garden doing the work there and, you know, barefoot if I can be, um, where I might be needing more support in the administrative part or the financial history. It's like those relationships of trust um, and authentic leadership and investing in that, like knowing that I can do that and when I can be present and my word needs to carry, you know, my word needs to be solid. It needs to carry weight. Um, that has really been one of my greatest accomplishments um, is building those relationships and continuing them. Um, it's really, I'm really fortunate to be a part of um, the Kitchenista program, Cooking for Salud, and promoting not just a healthier lifestyle, but making it culturally responsive and speaking to, yes, you know, environmental issues. Um, and I, you know, Jacqueline was talking about not, you know, c calling out moms that, you know, have kids and not asking them to, you have to use, you know, green cutlery, but I will, I am that person, you know, I'm there with the other moms and I, I will, I will tell you, you know, yeah, I was like, you know, all those, all those forks, those hundred forks you have in the drawer, use those instead. And so I am that person. I feel very comfortable, you know. I take ownership in that way, but because I can, again, it's not an outsider saying do this. It's because like, I'll say, yeah, I, you know, I had to do this. Let's go to the thrift store and they have them for like $2. You can buy the whole thing and reuse it if you can. And, and not in a judgmental way, you know, really speaking from a place of love and then just letting it go. Because when you, cuando te clavas, you know, this is a saying, like when you just dig your heels down and you just want to make it a point, you want to be right that's not where it's at, especially when you're trying to create change in the community. You just, you know, speak to your experience and do it with love. And later on, you know, someone might 
check out your vibe and see that you've actually done it and it's sustainable and that they can do it too, that it's accessible. Um, I've given up meeting, eating meat for the most part or as much as I used to. I became a vegetarian and I'll speak to this because there's variations as you know. <laughs> they know because they're like, all right, let's see, mom tells the whole story. Um, in 2009, I became vegetarian. It was really difficult for me because I actually love the taste of meat. We grew up in a family, you know, we're very blessed to have full meals and fruits and vegetables accessible to us thanks to my mom and lots of meat. Lots of meat. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I liked the taste, but then understanding the impacts that it has on the environment, you know, that was heartbreaking and I could connect the dots and then also for my health. And so I want to live a long, healthy life and be there for my children and my community and, and go to a lot of parties and dance a lot. So I want to be healthy. Um, and so I, I chose to make that choice. And then people, our Mexican community, you know, our ethnic communities are like, how do you do that? And I'm like, I cheat, you know, I cheat a lot, um, especially, you know, transitioning to become a pescatarian like right away when I found out that was a term um, you know just seafood is great especially Mexican mariscos um, but also you know if I want to taste meat that week or if my tia's offering that to me or you know I'm at a quinceanera or I want to try the burger because I, you know who's gonna punish me I'm going to try my best the next week to not eat or consume meat products but this is a, a relationship uh, that I have with myself and yes, the environment, Mother Earth. Um, but just, you know, s explaining this without having so much of, uh, of a blame game, kind of changing the narrative. And so when I explain it to my compas or like my tias, and they're like, oh, you don't eat meat, so have some chicken. And I'm like, no, like actually, <laughs> you know, that's still a type of meat. But I say, it's okay, you know, um, you can cheat, and that's how I've made it sustainable um, and culturally responsive for me. That's how I've been able to do it for as long as I can. It's almost, yeah, it's 10 years now, and so it's like I'm a cheating fool, but <laughs> it's, you know, definitely what, long longevity, and I'm able to cut down on my uh, use of resources. So I feel like we've done a really good job of hitting as many angles as we can in this conversation, whether it be the systemic issues that have brought us here, the personal choices that we have made. And one of the last things I would like to touch on is something that you mentioned, Thea, about small businesses mm -hmm. not necessarily having all the tools in their toolbox to be in this fight for climate justice. And so I think that it is wonderful to hold local businesses accountable and ask them what are they doing and have a conversation going. But ultimately, it's very important that we hold corporations accountable as well because they are the ones who are mass producing um, and enfranchising this extractive economy that has kind of been the catalyst to climate destruction. And I use climate destruction because I feel like with climate change, there's this narrative that it's about the ice caps melting and sea levels rising and temperature rising. And most folks are like, you know, everything's going to be OK. But when you talk about climate destruction in the sense of poor air quality, asthma, cancer, people are dying from these ec like ecosystems collapsing. And so when we hold corporations accountable us personally it may look like different things it could be boycotting certain brands mm -hmm. it could be making a conscious decision to maybe if you can't give up something and this is something that i've learned in school as a holistic health practitioner is that it's very hard to ask someone to cut something out of their life it is a lot easier to ask people to add something into their life so for example if you're not able to completely stop buying gasoline maybe you could add walking or biking into something in your life to make it more sustainable and have the longevity that you are staying and you're talking about when it comes to your diet practices so it's like what are ways in which you have personally made a conscious decision to not support certain corporations because they don't align with your ethics and your morals and the restoration of this planet or what are some ideas whether it's writing policy or advocating or activism the thing that helps me the most is being cheap 
<laughs> and I think when you really, when you share that with people, it's, this is helping not only the environment, but it's helping you. Mm -hmm. So being able to boycott corporations, and you and I talk about that all the time. I'm like, oh, good. I don't shop there anyways. Mm -hmm. Like I, it's, and, and I think my husband really helped me with this is realizing that you don't need so much stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't, sh I don't shop really. Mm -hmm. Uh, Thrift stores are fine. You find amazing stuff there mm -hmm. if you really need, like, a lot of my suits are from there for work and whatever it may be. So realizing that you mm -hmm. don't need stuff, mm -hmm. that your space looks better when you get rid of mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. that was huge for me, and I think that's super helpful. But also, um, eating healthier also allowed me to stay away from a lot of corporations mm -hmm. or um, grocery stores that are not, that do contribute to mm -hmm. harming the environment and harming their workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not going to Walmart, um, not buying the Coke and the sodas because it's not good for you, but also those are the people that are hurting my communities. Mm -hmm. You know, they're hurting a lot of the indigenous communities throughout Mexico and Latin America. So mm -hmm. why would I support them? And do I really need it? Mm -hmm. Do we really need that at our parties? And so... Even that was like a, a big choice for me at my wedding mm -hmm. was, you know, people were like, oh, you're going to have soda. No, I'm not going to have soda. Why? They don't they don't need it. <laughs> this is my it's my party. So like you're going to eat and drink what I tell you. Right. Mm -hmm. So being able to make those choices and everything was fine. We had, you know, the Mexican flavored waters. People were fine. We had water, but we had water in um, what is it? Garrafones in the jugs. Mm -hmm. So like no bottles. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the plates were were uh, paper plates, you know, mm -hmm. so you can. It's not. It's not that hard, mm -hmm. and it was cheaper as far as the drinks too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I was telling people like you're saving money for your right. for your family by doing that. I think that that that's a way to communicate with a lot of people, mm -hmm. a lot of lower income people. It's like really you're just save you're saving money by mm -hmm. by not doing that. Same thing when the way that I shop, and I, I like the way that you explained it to our cousin uh, Ronnie was, yeah, you shop, you stay on the outside of the, of the market. Mm -hmm. When you go through the aisles, you're using the plastic, you're buying stuff that's worse for you. Um, it's all packaged stuff. So doing that really helps. Mm -hmm. And I never realized that, but that is the way that I shop. And it's like, again, like I only buy what I need mm -hmm. and I'm cheap. And it, it, it makes a huge difference, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then supporting local businesses. So... Um, buying jewelry from my friends that make it mm -hmm. instead of going to a corporation, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. buying stuff at the powwows that I attend, you know, supporting my native communities instead of like buying earrings from somewhere else or yeah. jewelry from somewhere else. You know exactly who made it. You know where it came from. Same thing with clothing, um, buying it from those types of, of venues as well. I mm -hmm. think that's, that's huge. Um, and with mom and pop, places too that may you know have a, a specific mission I think that mm -hmm. like you said adding something is a lot easier but also replacing it so you're not taking mm -hmm. anything away you're just finding a sustainable substitute or a cheaper mm -hmm. substitute really um and oh carrying bottles uh reusable bottles that's mm -hmm. huge for me again because I'm cheap I don't want to buy water bottle and like I drink so much water throughout the day, it's easier for me to have a reusable water bottle than to constantly be, be buying stuff yeah. wherever I go. And I think that that's, that's huge too. I wish I could do it with uh, reusable plates. I carry, I mean, containers. Mm -hmm. um, I carry them in my car, but like on a day to day, it's not, it's, that's not sustainable for me. But if that, that would be like ultimate goals. Right. So, mm -hmm. so that when I get something to go, I already have it ready mm -hmm. to go. Planting seeds, literally, um, and shifting consciousness, especially with our younger students, really students of any age, though. Um, some of the kids, you know, at one of the events that we had at the school, you know, a, a student was like, I've always wanted to plant a seed. And, you know, I take it for granted that that's been an ongoing experience for me. Um, but really, you know, shifting that consciousness where knowing that you can 
create that sustainable future and that sustainable present you know once you do that you're forever changed and speaking of change and continuing to implement and facilitate these leadership programs i think they're mm -hmm. you know creating change and not so much creating leaders because we're all leaders we all want to have a happy healthy future for us and for our loved ones and you know be able to be heard and so uh, i want to continue that work but also encourage others to do that to plant those seeds in the way that you can whether it's with uh, you know again the music or with art or with literature any to me everything is education and everything is health and so you know being able to shift consciousness if it is way on the other side of the spectrum where someone has never planted a seed literally um, or having those conversations with you know our most um, impressionable populations youth you know even uh, our elders if they haven't had that human touch and it's like how do you communicate with them and we actually might be getting more out of that interaction than they will um they're getting something out of at the present but we're going to have something that is everlasting and so that's you know a, a bit of a call to action i'm really thankful to be here um with my family here in national city on kumi island i thank mothers out front for giving us this opportunity to share our voice and the voice of our community and um, the voice of our community members to come. This is really important work. And thank you for including us in it, for including the community, for including our ancestors in this process. Thank you so much. And just show up. <laughs> keep that same energy. Mm -hmm. Like, I wish people would keep the same energy when they show up to Black Friday mm -hmm. or to buy a Popeye's chicken sandwich. Like, keep that same energy on election day to vote on these issues that are impacting your communities. Keep that same energy when your friend or your organizations uh, that you see on social media, that you know about, when they have an event, show up. Keep that same energy. I think that's huge. It's so easy for people to do it when they're hyped up yeah. about something hip or popular. And it's like, no, like do it when it really counts. Mm -hmm. Major shout out. Oh, shout out. Shout out to Green Friday. San Diego is going to be practicing celebrating Green Friday versus Black Friday. So enjoy your beaches, your parks. I'm all about that. So we practice that as a family and I'm really glad to hear that the county is wanting to promote this. Green Friday, show up, keep that same energy. Um, I just wanted to send like a last message that the way we have gotten here has been through disembodiment of the planet, disembodiment of ourselves, and also disassociation. We have been taught from a very young age to disassociate whether our actions have consequences, where your food came from, who picked your food, what working conditions are they in. These are thoughts that we were systemically brought up in this colonized country to not think about. And so moving forward... Now that we have this insight and we have shared and we have poured our emotional labor into this conversation, just remember to be embodied and to have connection to your healing and even to your suffering and even to your pain. And through the healing of this planet often comes the healing of yourself. There's a very deep relationship there. I wanted to say thank you to my tia and to my mom for taking time out of their lives to sit here. Um, and to my tia Michelle, because even though she may not be a mother in the traditional sense, she has very much been a mother figure in my life and in my cousin's life and in my sister's life. And many of us also have that gift and that quality to share with our community that even though we may not be a mother because we have children, we are a mother because we are caretakers and because we love the young ones in our life and even the elderly in our life and we hope that they are constantly embodied in this movement and represented fairly so thank you guys thank you i love you thank you thank you for sharing this space and we hope to see you all at any mother's outfit events and their sister organizations mundo gardens and any other organizations you want to be a part of yeah i don't have any right now <laughs> there will be there will be <laughs> shout out to chicano park so we'll see you out and about. Thank you. Mm -hmm.